blowing a job interview because you answered a simple question incorrectly is beyond frustrating. More unnerving is the fact that you may never realize that the reason you didn't get that coveted job is because you answered one of these deceptively difficult but easy looking questions incorrectly. Most savvy professionals prepare for a job interview without giving a moment's notice to the questions that are costing them those sought after job offers time and time again. We're going to go over each question and provide you with the correct answer, not the one you think is the correct answer, but the answer your interviewer is hoping to hear. Make sure you Stick around until the end when we dissect the one question few think they need to prepare for and they forget most get it wrong. Of course, we'll show you how to answer it the right way. The response will get you one step closer to that desired job offer. Answering the dreaded what is your greatest weakness interview question is a real challenge. Apparently the are you for real response is not an acceptable answer, nor is replying with a non-weakness such as I work too hard and forget my other obligations. Trust me when I tell you that everyone can see right through that response. Because this is asked so frequently and it is a difficult question to answer intelligently without shooting yourself in the foot, I decided to do a bit of research to see how the experts would answer this question. Based on their insights, we've got some tips to help you navigate this treacherous question. Now, personally, I think this is a really stupid thing to ask people. I mean, really? Do you think anyone is going to be totally honest and say things like, I'm frequently late for work, or I usually end up not getting along with my boss, or the myriad of other management nightmares most managers find themselves dealing with all too frequently? I don't think so. Be that as it may, this is a frequently asked question. And apparently, if you want the job, you are expected to take it seriously and answer it appropriately. So I'll stop my rant and try and provide the information you need to create a decent response. In case you haven't guessed, my eye rolling and theatrics is not the way to go. By the way, another version of this, which you should also prepare for, is what would your current boss say is your greatest weakness? Whatever you choose as the weakness you will reveal also include how you're going to work to fix it. So let's dive right in. Tip number one. When responding to the what's your greatest weakness question, choose the weakness that will not prevent you from succeeding in the job you are applying for. So for example, if you're in finance, accounting, accounts payable space, you really don't want to say something like, mm, I could use a little help with my analytical skills. I'm not that good with numbers. That might be fine if you're applying for a position as a guidance counselor or maybe in marketing, but not so much in finance and accounting. At a minimum, steer away from anything mentioned in the job requirements, although there is one exception which we'll discuss towards the end of this talk. Tip number two when responding to that awful what is your greatest weakness question, say, share something you would like to improve, but again, not something that's critical to the position you're applying for. You should also include some thoughts again on how you're going to improve in this area. You might say, I would love to improve my public speaking skills. I've joined Toastmasters to gain more confidence in public speaking. Or, I've never really had to use pivot tables, but I do think they could be useful in analyzing data. So I've been teaching myself how to create them and working with some of our accounts payable data. Something like that. Okay. Tip number three. Try taking this tact when responding to that obnoxious, what is your greatest weakness question. Think about a weakness that you have in your personal life. Can you reuse that here? Now, you can't say something like, I'm a lousy quick cook, because that wouldn't work in most cases. But here are a few that might be manipulated somewhat into working for you professionally without doing too much damage to you, the prospects of you getting a job. Okay, and I made a list. I'm an introvert. Sometimes I lack self-confidence. I can be tactless. I suffer from imposter syndrome. I have fear of public speaking. I'm talkative. Now, when I saw talkative being on some of these lists, I was scratching my head and I thought, hmm. But here's how HubSpot says that you could explain that. And I think they really did a brilliant job. They said, they suggest you say, I enjoy developing a relationship with my coworkers by engaging in conversation. And that's a great team building skill. However, I have a habit of carrying on a conversation to the point where it may distract others. I have learned since then that there are other ways to connect with my coworkers and that if I'm asking about their day, I need to keep it brief and redirect myself back to my work. So that was pretty good. I certainly wouldn't have thought of it myself. Tip number four 
when we're responding to your what's your greatest weakness question. Don't forget to show how you're going to overcome the, the weakness. Now, I have another great response, this one from Better Up. And here's what they suggest you say. I can feel timid when providing feedback to others. I never want to hurt anyone's feelings. But in my previous role, I realized that constructive feedback can help others improve themselves. So as long as I approach them with kindness and empathy, now I'm much less reluctant to help others do their best. I honestly, I thought that was a pretty brilliant way to approach it. Do you agree with me? If so, let me know in the comments below. Tip number five, here's how you can make that awful, what is your greatest weakness question work for you. That's right. You can make it work for you. Turn that lack of experience in a particular area of the job into a positive. So you might say, for example, some might consider the fact that I have never worked in this field before as a great weakness. However, I'm a fast learner and I bring no preconceived notions on how to perform my job. Then if you know how you're going to close the information gap, explain how you're going to do it. But many people have found themselves in a position where they have, you know, hired somebody who is preset in their ways. You know, they think that the way they did it at their old job is the way it has to be done, is the best way. And so they may be happy with this. So again, fast learner, don't forget to say you're a fast learner. And maybe you can turn that negative into a positive. That would be a great thing. Bottom line, whatever you choose, Make sure not only you mention whatever the perceived weakness is, also share how you're trying to fix it, how you're trying to acquire whatever the missing skill is. Answering that anxiety producing, why should we hire you question, throws a lot of accounting and finance and accounts payable professionals into a tizzy. Most would love to skip this question, but since you probably want the job, skipping the question is not an option. Actually, it provides you with a golden opportunity if you can step up to the plate and knock it out of the ballpark with a great answer. But how, you ask? What can you say to seal the deal and make them see that you really are the ideal candidate to join their team? We're about to show you. First, I'd like to address what you absolutely, under no circumstances, should say. While a job interview is a two-way street, there's no need to be a completely open book. They are learning about you and evaluating you to see if you're a good fit. But likewise, you should be learning about the company and trying to determine if it, it is a good fit for you. Is it a job you'd enjoy doing and will you fit in with the corporate culture? Or will it be like trying to mix oil with water? That being said, there's no reason to overshare. There are some things better left unsaid. So when they ask you why they should hire you, you really can't say what you're really thinking, which might be something along the lines of, because I really want or need this job, or because I need another job because my boss is driving me up the wall, or something that reflects your own self-interest. Remember, in answering this question, it's all about what you can do for them, not what they can do for you. Likewise, when, you re when responding, you want to avoid sounding obnoxious. So you need to proceed with a little caution because the right response can be a real game changer. With the right response, gaining you the coveted job offer and the wrong one, effectively turning it into a deal breaker. Although you'll never realize that's what happened. Let's start by walking the proverbial mile in the shoes of the interviewer. Remember, that person has a boss too. Someone they are probably going to have to justify their high decision to. The easier time they have justifying their decision to make you an offer instead of someone else, the better your chances are of getting that offer. So you want to give them the ammunition they need when their boss asks them, why should we hire the person that they are recommending, which hopefully will be you. What they are looking for from you is one, an understanding of what they need, that you have that understanding, and two, an explanation of how you will fill that need. So sadly, this is not one of those questions when you can craft one great answer and use it at several different interviews. You may be able to rough something out ahead of time based on the job description, but you will probably want to refine it based on what the interviewer has said during the interview. 
Typically, this question will be asked towards the end of the interview. Your response should include both the requirements listed in the job description and information you have gleaned during the interview. By the time they ask this question, you should have ascertained, either because they told you or if they didn't, you asked, why there is an opening. If it is a brand new position, it is critical that you have uncovered what they are expecting the person in this position to accomplish. Make sure you address how you would meet that goal in your response. Either way, if you've done a good job during the interview, asking questions to ascertain what they're looking for, you can and should weave that into your response, taking care to address their pain points. That is why it is essential that you listen to every last word the interviewer says during the interview. It's critical that you understand what's important to them and then address that issue in your response. Sometimes it will have been in the job description, but sometimes it won't, and that's where you can really shine. For example, if there has been a lot of disagreements between purchasing and accounts payable and the new position is for a director of accounts payable, you might mention several steps you took in a past position to smooth out ruffled relationships with purchase. This is the type of thing that does not get mentioned in the job description, but the interviewer will probably talk about it. Now, I know sometimes people get nervous during an interview and that makes it difficult to focus on what the other person is saying, but you absolutely must. What's more, by focusing on what they are saying, some of your nerves will dissipate, and that's a good thing. If you have any relevant experience to the job, make sure you incorporate that in your response. For if you can show you have already done something that they're looking for, you will have removed some of their anxiety about making the right hire. When responding, be as specific as possible. Try and avoid saying things like, I'm a hard worker, or I'm very conscientious. Well, these are desirable attributes. Anyone could say it could say that and you have no proof. It doesn't prove anything and more importantly or most importantly it won't move the needle in your favor especially if there are other equally talented job candidates all of whom are going to say they are hard workers and conscientious. Your goal is to differentiate yourself differentiate yourself in a positive way from the pack. Bottom line, be as specific as possible with real life examples where possible. Let me give you a sample response. Let's say they are looking to hire a director of accounts payable who can research and implement a new automation solution in addition to running the department and of course managing relations with the purchasing department which are frayed at this point. If you've done it before you might say something like this. I've been running the accounts payable department for ABC company for the last six years and two years ago, I led the implementation team when they installed an automation solution. As part of that process, we looked at 12 different solutions. While I'd want to do a quick review of any new products that may have come on the market in the last two years, I'd be ready to hit the ground running for your automation initiative. And you might also want to add, if this is the job again where accounts payable and purchasing have been having some clashes, when I was hired as the accounts payable manager at my last job, the one I've already been talking about, the relations with purchasing were also frayed. I invited the purchasing manager to lunch and told him I wanted to improve things. Together, we mapped out a plan. We agreed to meet every two weeks and discuss whatever had caused friction between the two groups in the prior two weeks. We had those meetings and we worked to identify root causes and then eliminate them. Sometimes it was accounts payable had to make a change, other times it was purchasing. But most of the time, it was just understanding what the other group was going through. We even initiated a plan where we had each of our team members spend one day in the other department going through with them what they did. Do you think something like that might work here? You've now addressed the two issues that seem to be important in this particular job situation. One from the job description and the other from listening to the interviewer explain what's needed. Warning, if it is a new position and in listening to them talk, you realize they have missed something or they look should be looking for some additional tasks, you wanna proceed carefully. I've seen very competent people unintentionally talk the interviewer out of hiring them due to some of the insights that they decided to share during the interview. Recommendation. Instead, as soon as you leave the interview, jot down everything you saw and heard. You might even dictate it into your smartphone before you have a chance to forget. Then, if you get the job, you have a list of action steps and recommendations you can make either when you start or at the end of your first week. This will make the hiring company recognize you for the superstar that you really are. It's inevitable. Going on a job interview, you are going to be asked what your salary requirements are. And you're probably going to be asked this awful question very early in the process before you've had a chance to get the lay of the land. 
answer with a number too high, and you can kiss that job goodbye. But answer with a lowball figure, and that's what they'll pay you. You could be potentially leaving tens of thousands of dollars on the table. The best advice regarding answering the what are your salary requirements question is to deflect it and try and avoid the subject until they fall madly in love with you. Then, hopefully, with you in the driver's seat, you can command a king's ransom for salary. Sadly, this piece of advice is often easier said than done. Before you go on any interviews, including Zoom interviews or pre-interviews as I like to call them, you need to decide how you're going to answer this question. You want to be ready because you're going to be asked. Here are some steps you can take to make sure you come up with a, your right response or a response. Step number one in determining your ideal salary request. First of all, do a little research beforehand so you know what is a reasonable salary for that position. You can look at salary.com, you can look at job listings for the similar positions in similar loca locales or your location. You can look in, on indeed.com, look at LinkedIn, etc. And don't forget to check Glassdoor as well as any other resources that you may have. Okay, that's step one. Step two, figure out what the minimum salary you would be willing to accept is. Don't share this, but have it in the back of your mind. So for example, if you need $75,000 a year to meet all your expenses, it's silly to go on a job interview paying $40,000. For as much as they are, uh, would like you, they are unlikely to have that much wiggle room. Step number three, estimate how much it is reasonable to expect to get. Once you have that number, you can decide whether or not that number is acceptable for you. After doing the research, you may just decide that your current job isn't as bad as you thought it was and doesn't pay as poorly as you thought, and you may just decide to stay put. But for the purposes of continuing this broadcast, let's assume that isn't the case and you want to go forward. Keep in mind that most people look for a 15 to 20 percent increase over their current salary unless, and this is a big one, the current salary is less than it should be. And I'm going to talk more about that later on in this talk. Once you've gone through the numbers, you have the information you need to answer that dreadful question if you are asked and decide to answer. When asked for your salary requirements, be prepared to provide a range with the following ca caveat, depending on the fringe benefits. So you can t say, um, you can give them a range. So for example, if you decided you wanted 80,000, you might say somewhere between 75,000 and 90,000, depending on the fringe benefits and the whole package. In the US, many employees must contribute to the cost of their medical care. And so that's a consideration also. You can also see if there is any company match for a 401k or a 503b retirement plan. And of course, the number of vacation days given also offers some wiggle room. I know a number of organizations whose salaries they know are on the lower side, so they offer um, additional vacation days. Now, many people, including me, are always concerned that if you give a range, the company will always try and get you at the very bottom of the, of the range. Now, occasionally, this will be true, but if you use the disclaimer about the benefits and other uh, things offered, you've at least partially covered yourself. So many people say, why not just give them a number? And I suppose you can if you want to. But let me share with you something that happened to me at the very beginning of my career. It was my second job. I had in mind a nice round number that I wanted to earn. No range here. I, I wasn't that sophisticated. So when the HR manager asked me what my requirements were, I told her. Boy, was I naive. It never occurred to me that I should ask for a little bit more in case they wanted to negotiate. But that didn't happen. They offered me what I asked for, which should have made me a little suspicious. But I was young, and for a while I was satisfied. But then, after I was there a little bit, I somehow found out, I forget how now, that they had been willing to pay and had budgeted for 15% more than I had asked for. Should this have mattered to me since I got what I wanted? Probably not, but I'm human and it did. And after all these years, here I am telling you about it. Would you have answered that question? Let us know in your, your thoughts on this issue in the comments. So if you decide you don't want to answer the question, how can you avoid answering it? Here are a few tactics. Tactic number one, put the onus back on them and ask how much they have budgeted for the position. Sometimes they'll answer, and then you can decide whether or not there's a match or you are so far apart that it's pointless to continue the conversation. 
of course, you can continue with the hope that they'll like you so much that they'll do whatever they have to to get you. But remember, it's unlikely anybody will ever pay double what they, they budgeted. All right. Number two, claim, rightly so, that at this point you don't know enough about the position and the benefits package to adequately answer that question. Tactic number three, occasionally you might get away with just not answering it. How? Just talk without answering. You can say something like, it would depend on many factors and talk a little bit about the word, the benefits, what the job entailed, how many people would be reporting to me. In a few cases, very few probably, they might not notice that you haven't answered, but don't count on this working too often, okay? Sometimes you're going to eventually have to um, answer the question and remember what happened to me. Keep in mind that they are asking you what your salary requirements are. They are not asking how much money you're making currently, or at least hopefully they're not. Now, if you're underpaid in your current job and they ask your current salary requirements, um, they'll say something like, what is your current salary? Because traditionally, this was the base from which they would craft their offer. But if your salary is lower than it should be, this puts you at a huge disadvantage, really huge. This is a large part of the explanation of the current gender wage gaps. That's why now, in almost half the states, it's illegal to ask that question. I believe eventually we'll all stop asking it, but we're not at eventually, we're here today. I saw a really great answer to that question on the website fearlesssalarynegotiation.com. Don't you love that? And here's how they suggested answering it. I'm not really comfortable sharing that information. I would prefer to focus on the value I can add to this company and not what I'm being paid in my current job. If that doesn't work, and there's a chance it won't, then try one of the deflection tactics we discussed earlier. Answering questions during a job interview is like walking a tightrope. You want to provide as much accurate information as possible without painting yourself in a negative light. This means that sometimes, without outright lying, it might be better to skirt the truth. This is especially true when the interviewer gets around to asking you, why do you want to leave your current position? There's the right way, the wrong way, and the terribly wrong way to respond to this question. And sometimes it is not clear which is which. Let's start with the right way. Now, in my humble opinion, this is a question you don't want to spend a lot of time addressing. So prepare a short but sweet response. Hope the interviewer doesn't probe too deeply. Why? In many instances, the real reason you are looking for a new opportunity has to do with a bad boss, horrible corporate culture with limited growth opportunities, or a lousy raise. Since rule number one of interviewing is to never badmouth anyone, you can't say any of these things without it reflecting poorly on you. I realize that it's difficult, but keep in mind, your goal is to obtain a new job. You can vent about your current situation to your family and friends. They'll be understanding and listening. Do it to a prospective employer and they will be dubious and you'll find your chances of landing that new position greatly diminished. So don't wait until you're sitting in the hot seat. Prepare your response ahead of time. You might even practice it ahead of time a few times, especially if it will be difficult for you to not be completely truthful on this matter. Then when asked, you can rattle off your response without looking uncomfortable or worse, like you're lying. Let me start with the easiest situation. This is where a recruiter has contacted you with an opening. On that first call, it is perfectly acceptable to indicate that you weren't looking for a new position, but you're always open to hearing about new and exciting opportunities. But that's for the first call only. After that, especially when interviewing at the company, it's a good idea to be able to add something more concrete. You might expand your response to include something positive about the company and the position. For example, you might say that after the recruiter explained the position to you, you were excited to throw your hat in the ring because the chance to work on new automation solutions or revamp their P-card program or whatever they're looking for was something or something else that was mentioned in the job description. Assuming that's not the situation though, for, and for most of us it won't be, and you're looking for a new spot, let's look at some perfectly acceptable responses regardless of the situation. 
You could say something like acceptable response number one. I'm ready to do more and my current employer has no opportunities on the horizon. My boss does an excellent job and her position would be the next logical move for me. However, it looks like she'll be in that job for some time to come. So that leaves me without opportunities or acceptable response number two. I've been looking for an organization whose core values align with mine and in searching your company fit, researching your company, there's a fit. Now, if you go this route, be ready to respond to the next obvious question. And what would those values be? In other words, don't use this suggested response unless it is true and you can articulate those values. This response must be customized. It's not a one size fits all. Acceptable response number three. I feel like I've plateaued in my current position and there are no opportunities on the horizon at my current company. The job, descrip the job description provided for this job is a good fit for my skill set and I feel like we'd be a good fit. Again, be ready to explain how. This response has to be customized to their job description. If you haven't seen one or it doesn't contain enough details, enough specific details, then you can't use this response. Now let's turn our attention to not acceptable responses. Not acceptable response number one, complaining about anything, no matter how true and how reasonable your complaints are. They make you look bad and they leave the interviewer wondering, is your current boss really the ogre you paint him out to be? Or are you just difficult to get along with? If you badmouth the, bad the company, it can leave them thinking, hmm, is this how she's going to be talking about us someday? So don't do it, even if you're 110% correct. Not acceptable response number two, saying you are bored or the work isn't challenging. Again, this might be completely true, but it will give them pause. They might think, hmm, maybe her current boss didn't think she was capable of taking on more. Or they may think, hmm, she probably gets bored easily. How long before the same thing happens here? They may also be wondering why you didn't try and find more interesting projects or make suggestions or recommendations yourself. Get where I'm going? It just opens too many possibilities for them and none of those possibilities reflect well or positively on you. Not acceptable response number three. I'm embarrassed to admit, but this one comes from me. I actually said it to a recruiter earlier in my career. When asked the quest, this question, why do you want to leave your current position? I said, it's time. It was the truth and I thought the answer was brilliant. By the way, it was not. After he picked himself up off the ground, he said to me, it's fine you tell me that, but never say that to the company, any company I send you to. He explained that the company hearing that would think, and someday she'll decide it's time to leave us. Have you ever said anything on interviews that in hindsight would probably be better left unsaid? Feel free to share it with us in the comments. Now, before we get to the really terrible ways to respond to, the, to this question, which by the way, may seem reasonable at first glance. If you're getting any value from this talk, I'd love it if you hit the thumbs up button. It sends a message that you're getting value from this talk and I should make more like it. A personal thanks from me to everyone who has hit that like button. And now to the terrible ways to respond to this question. Terrible response number one. Let's say you want to move to a city quite a distance from where you are currently located. Maybe you're in Chicago and you want to go to Philadelphia. Maybe your partner's family lives there. Or maybe, like my son-in-law, he desperately wanted to be near his favorite baseball team, the Boston Red Sox. Whatever. Do not indicate that as your reason for applying for the job, especially if you're hoping to get relocation expenses. This will be a huge red flag. No company wants you simply because you want to move to the area and they're going to be the accommodation for that. They want you to want them, not a meal ticket, to get where you want to go. Include some valid business reasons as discussed earlier. If it comes up, it's fine to say your in-laws live in the area, but leave it at that and don't you bring it up. Terrible response number two, you want or need more money. Never share that. They will think it's only a matter of time before you want or need more money again, and you'll be out looking or worse. The moment somebody dangles a few extra bucks in front of you, you'll jump. In general, 
You want to present yourself and the situation in such a way that you are pursuing this new opportunity solely on the merits of the job and the opportunity. The money should always come secondary, regardless of your true motivation. Terrible response number three, you feel undervalued. Don't say it. In all likelihood, you're going to be asked this question, so prepare ahead of time. Make sure your response coordinates with what I like to call this question's evil twin, another one that can get you in trouble. When they ask you, why should we hire you? When I tell you about this question, you're going to say, that's not a trick question. I can answer that better than anyone else. And that's where the problem lies. Yes, you can, but the answer you give is apt to be wrong and can torpedo your entire interview. What's worse, you won't even realize your the answer was poor and that you've told the interviewer far too much about yourself. We've got some tips on how to answer the question, what you should include, and most importantly, what not to include. Make sure you stick around until the end when we share the one interview oversight too many ignore, even though in hindsight they should have known better. Now, drum roll, please. What's this nightmare question? The question is, tell me about yourself. Before you click off thinking, I can't possibly be right, consider this. What is the interviewer attempting to achieve when they ask this question? He or she appears to be throwing you a softball question, one that you can answer easily and hopefully, at least for the interviewer, one that will put you at ease and allow you to lower your guard. When you feel comfortable, you're more likely to share, to overshare, and that's not a good situation when you're on an interview. So tip number one, this is not the time to talk about your personal life. This is not an invitation to share your life story. So to be harsh, no one cares, at least at this point. The interviewer is trying to assess whether you'll fit in with their existing team. So resist the temptation to pull out your wallet and start sharing pictures of your children, no matter how adorable they may be. Also, with a passion, resist talking about your hobbies, especially ones that you devote a lot of time to. Telling an interviewer that you are a dedicated marathoner who regularly runs 50 hours a week to keep in shape for an upcoming marathon might seem like a smart idea. But all the interviewer will hear is, oh, this guy spends a lot of time training, or this woman spends a lot of time training, and then they'll start to wonder if you'll cut out early or come in late, etc., to fill in your workouts. So you ask, if you can't talk about your personal self, what are you supposed to talk about? Tip number two, start with your professional experience and how it is relevant to the job they are trying to fill. This is your golden opportunity to sell yourself to attempt to steer the conversation towards your strengths rather than your weaknesses. Give a succinct review of your experience and any relevant qualifications or certifications if they were also requested in the job description, and of course, if you have them, as it relates to your job. Try and position yourself and your response in terms of with if, not with him. In other words, what's in it for them, not what's in it for me. Remember to review the job, posting, and if at all possible, highlight how your experiences will meet their requirements. And by the way, this is also your opportunity to introduce any special skill you have that they didn't mention in the job posting, but you might think is useful and might differentiate you from other candidates. For example, if you're interviewing with a French company and are fluent in French, this might be the time to make, mention it. But make sure you can deliver because the person interviewing you may start speaking in French. In this example, in an ideal situation, your response will leave them feeling that you are the best candidate for the position. Now you may be wondering if you can create one response to this question and use it every time you're interviewed. Good question. Tip number three, not exactly. Let me explain. You want to know your audience, know who you're talking to, and tailor your response. If you're going through the first interview, possibly somebody from HR who is doing the screening, you might have a different, less technical response than if it, you're having your second or third interview with the person you're going to be reporting to. In the first instance, you would talk more in generalities, and in the latter, it might be fine to dive down a little bit into some of the technical details. So, for example, in the first case where you're talking to HR, you might mention you've done 1099s and leave it at that. 
But in the latter, you might discuss some of the differences or problems that people encounter when they're doing 1099 MISCs as opposed to 1099 NECs. Of course, assuming you know this information. Okay, this leads to the obvious question in the latter case. Is it okay to talk at great length? Tip number four, no. It is never okay to ramble. Avoid that at all costs. You never want to be boring, so if possible, avoid that. So keep the answer to questions, like every other question, short and succinct. I realize this might be a little counterintuitive, as you might rightly think that you'll come across better in the interview if you're relaxed. And yes, you want to relax, but not too much. So tip number five, yes, relax a little, but not so much that you don't carefully weigh each word that comes out of your mouth during the interview. Relaxing too much can lead to you sharing more than you should. Now, this leads some people to think that they should memorize their response to, you know, uh, tell me about yourself. But tip number six, you shouldn't. For starters, it will sound canned. A better strategy is to map out your answer ahead of time, like in bullet points. The odds of you being asked this are high, so prepare, but realize you'll have to adapt a little bit for each situation. One way to structure this answer, and by the way, this is recommended by quite a few HR experts, is to talk about the past, the present, and the future. So you might say something like, I've worked in accounting for the last 10 years. For the last three years, I've been the accounts payable manager for ABC Company, where I managed a staff of five. In addition to the typical AP function, I also did some analytical work to support the purchasing staff. Moving forward, I hope to expand by experience with and make sure what you're planning for the future matches the job that they are looking to fill. So you can see how this could be different from time to time. Now, you may be wondering if there is anything else you should avoid. Tip number seven, as we said earlier, this is not an invitation to tell your life story. Do not overwhelm the interviewer with irrelevant information or stories that have little relevance to the job. What else can you do to improve your chances of landing that dream job? When you get to the end of the interview and they ask, do you have any questions? Don't blow it. This is your opportunity to make them realize that you are the ideal candidate for the job. But what should you ask, you think? We think the answer to this question is so important. We did a separate talk on it, which you can watch right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen if you're watching this on YouTube and is in the description. Good luck.